then he asked had the people prayed and I'm making a very long story short because he couldn't get up he was passing out unconscious he asked for buckets of water to be brought seven of them and dumped them on him this is also part of the prophetic healing brothers and sisters if your children get ill with fever put water on them this is the prophetic medicine for this if you feel feverish yourself dump water on yourself after the seventh one he said that's enough and he felt better and he was wiping his face and then he was falling unconscious he asked have the people prayed Aisha said they're waiting for you he said have the people prayed when he woke up again they said they're waiting for you so he had someone his cousins pick him up and start to carry him towards the masjid and he told them go get Abu Bakr and tell him to lead the salah and they complained they, Aisha said yeah. Ya Rasulullah, my father, he's very, the people, you know, my, he cries too much in his salah and he has a soft voice. Why don't we let Omar do it? The Prophet والسلام, repeated again, tell Abu Bakr to lead the salah. They said the same thing. After that, he was very firm with them. Tell Abu Bakr to lead the salah. He was not taking any other recourse. And Abu Bakr was hiding. Abu Bakr, they had to go find him because Abu Bakr did not want to step in front of the Prophet while he was alive. But Abu Bakr went to lead the Salah and our Prophet was brought forward. He saw that Abu Bakr was in front of the people and he smiled. But then Abu Bakr tried to step back and our Prophet motioned to him to stay. No, 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 stay. And he had a chair. He had a chair put next to Abu Bakr and he prayed with him in the front right next to him. After the Salah, our Prophet, very weak, barely, barely able to speak, he delivered another long sermon about taking care of the Ansar, how the Ansar was so special to him, but they would become very few in number like, like salt in a big bucket of water, so make sure you take care of them. And he praised the Muhajirun. But then listen what he said. The first thing he said was, if I've ever harmed any of you, this is the best of Allah's creation, saying if I've ever harmed any of you, and if I owe anything to any one of you, if any one of you thinks that I owe him something or have done him some wrong, then take your rights back from me now. One man said, you owe me a few dinar, and the Prophet said, give it to him. Another man stood up and said, oh Messenger of Allah, one day you slapped me in the stomach. When the Prophet والسلام, was straightening the rose for salah, he tapped the man in the stomach, his stomach was too far out. He was either, you know, telling him to push your back or go on a diet. So he tapped his stomach lightly. But the man is saying, you smack my stomach, I want my right. So the Prophet والسلام, lifted up his shirt and said, take your right from me. And the man came forward and kissed his blessed stomach. He said, he said, I only said that so I could kiss you. And then the Prophet والسلام, said, a man has been given a choice between staying in this world or going to be with Allah and he has chosen to go be with Allah. And Abu Bakr cried out with tears in his eyes, may our mothers and fathers be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. And the people were wondering, why is Abu Bakr crying? He's only talking about a man who was given a choice to be with Allah or stay here. And then the people started to realize the Prophet والسلام, was talking about himself. So the Prophet والسلام, went back to the room with Aisha. He became even more sick. Some time, a couple of days had passed, he became sick. I don't want to get through this. I'm running out of time. But on Monday, on a Monday, the Prophet والسلام, was laying his head again on the chest of Aisha radiallahu anha wa Aisha's brother walked into the room and he was carrying a, a miswak. And the Prophet Aisha understood her husband because he was looking at the siwak. She understood her husband. She asked him, O Messenger of Allah, do you want it? And he motioned, yes, I want it. So she took the miswak and she brushed his teeth. He brushed his teeth the best that he could. After that, Aisha said she took it from him and she brushed her own teeth so that she could one more time taste the saliva of her husband. Then the angel of death, this is something we're not privy to, Aisha wasn't privy to, but 
when the angel of death comes to you or I, when the angel of death presents himself to you or I, it's a one-sided conversation. Soul come out. Either blessed soul come out easy, Khabib's soul is going to be ripped out, but one way or the other that soul is coming out. There is no, there's no conversation that takes place. You might say, Rabbi, Rajiun, my Lord, send me back. But it's not going to happen. The soul's coming out. But with the NBA, there's a different modus operandus that the angel of death abides by. He needs to take permission. This is the respect that Allah gave to the NBA that even the angel of death needs to seek permission. And the Prophet ﷺ said before dying, all of the Anbiya were shown their places in Jannah. They were shown their final resting place. The angel of death came and took permission from the Prophet ﷺ, giving them the choice. Aisha radiallahu anha wardaha said she heard the Prophet ﷺ say, Be with the companion on Most High. Be with the companion on Most High. Be with the companion on Most High. She said, then she started him looking up at the ceiling as the Prophet said, the eyes followed the soul. And the angel of death took the greatest soul that Allah had ever created and that Allah will ever have created and placed it in the highest ranks of Al Jannah. And our Prophet والسلام, died on a Monday. And Aisha said she felt him get heavier and heavier on her chest until she realized he was gone. And she couldn't handle it. She couldn't take it. She couldn't handle it. She laid him down and she covered him with a, with a very simple Yemeni cloth. And she went out to the masjid and was screaming, Ya Rasulullah, Oh Rasulullah is gone. He's gone. There's no more wahi. There's no more Quran. There's no nothing. He's gone. The companions that were leaving, there was a few people around. They stopped. They, they were trying to really grasp, did she say what she just said? This is something very, very few of them could even handle. She said, he's gone. When that word was given to Umar, when Umar was told Muhammad Wasallam is dead, Umar, this is the same man, you have to understand, this is the same man that two decades ago, this same man had a sword in his hand on his way to the house of Muhammad Sallallahu ready to kill him, to end the message, to end the man, to end the Islam, to end the Muslims. Now this same man has a sword in his hand. Why? Because he cannot bear to even grasp or, or recognize the thought that this man Muhammad, whom he loves more than his own soul, is dead. And he is saying, whoever says Muhammad is dead, you're a hypocrite. And I will cut your neck. Uthman said his legs got weak and he couldn't hold him up anymore. He fell down. Abu Bakr, who was a distance away, he had taken permission because the day before the Prophet seemed if he was getting better on Sunday. He took permission to leave for a little while. The news was given to him that Muhammad is dead. He immediately dropped everything and he ran to the house of Aisha radiallahu and his daughter. He walked into the room where the Prophet was covered and he uncovered his face and they said that his tears started to fall and drop on the face of the Prophet and he said you are beautiful in life and you are beautiful in death and he covered his face and he went outside to the masjid and there was confusion going on you see our Prophet knew who should be the leader after him the one who kept it all together Abu Bakr radiallahu an stood up on the member of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and he said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, whosoever worshipped Muhammad, know that Muhammad is dead. He's died. But whomsoever worships Allah, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al hay He is alive and he never dies. And then he recited the very beautiful verse, Muhammad is nothing but a messenger and the messengers have passed away before him. If he dies or he is killed, will you then turn back? The companion said it was as if the Quran was being revealed to us again for the first time. Omar said when he heard that, it was as if he had heard the Quran again for the first time. This was our leader after the Prophet Abu Bakr who kept it together.
kept it together and they realized that he was gone. They said that on that day they were like sheep whose shepherd had left them on a cold dark night. They didn't know what they were supposed to do next. And wallahi, 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 that is the saddest day in human history. The day that our Prophet والسلام, died is the worst and saddest day of humanity. There was a woman on that day who completely understood what had just happened. And this is how I will begin to wrap it up and why I'm telling you this. There was a woman on that day who understood what had happened. Her name was Um Ayman. Um Ayman. Anybody know who Um, um Ayman was? She's the woman who took care of the Prophet after his mother died. She became his mother for the rest of his life. If you want to look, brothers, how to treat your mother, go look at the way the Prophet والسلام, dealt with Um anha She was his mother after his mother. Whenever he walked into, she walked into the room, he would jump up, give her his spot, give her the attention a mother deserves. She became sad on that day and she said something that is profound. She said, the sadness of this day is because the wahi from Allah has stopped. She said, is, the Prophet was going to die, he's human, he dies, but the sadness is that the wahi, the revelation, is stopped. Allah will not speak to us ever again until the day we meet him. The communication between Allah and his creation is gone. There are no more NBA. Jibreel's job is retired for now. The wahi is no more. But you see, those companions understood something about that reality that we have failed to grasp in the 21st century. They understood that yes, the wahi has stopped. And that's only because Allah said everything that He needed to say. And that revelation is with us. Al-Quran, Kalam Allah. The companions understood that and they understood that yes, maybe Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the deliverer of that message to us from Allah has gone. But that does not mean that humanity has to stop hearing the wahi. That does not mean that the words of Allah die on earth. They knew that the only way that this wahi, this revelation would continue to live amongst mankind was if they did the job that was left to them in the farewell sermon to go and convey the message. And they did it flawlessly. They did it the best. They were the exemplars in that after the Prophet ﷺ. This is why Allah said about them, Kuntum khayran ummatin linnas. They were the best ummah. They were the best. We have to say Alhamdulillah for them. We have to say Alhamdulillah for Abu Bakr. Alhamdulillah for Umar, for Uthman, Abdurrahman, Ibn Auf, uh, Abu Ubaidah, Ibn Al-Jarrah, Aisha. All of them. We have to say Alhamdulillah for them because they did their job. And because of their efforts, the deen spread. Look what it's become today. One and a half billion people on earth who are living their legacy who still say Muhammad Rasulullah because of the efforts they made what about us what are we doing with our lives what are we doing with our lives when the people of Norway when the people of Oslo look at you they should see the living legacy of the man named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When the people of the world look at this ummah, they should be seeing the ummah of Muhammad. They should be seeing the legacy of Abu Bakr. They should be seeing the legacy of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of Uthman. They should be seeing the legacy of Aisha radiallahu anha. They should be seeing the legacy of Fatima radiallahu anha. They should be seeing the legacy of these people in us. We have a chance now. Allah has given us the spotlight. 
I remember there was a time, Sheikh Haytham probably remembers, I know Imam Siraj remembers when there was a time we begged for media coverage about Islam. We begged for them to look at us. We begged for them to pay us attention. Yes or no, Imam? We begged for it. Now we have their undivided attention. We have the world's undivided attention. They want to know what you are doing. They want to know what you are saying. They want to know what you're eating. They want to know where you're sleeping. They want to know everything about you and we act as if that's a bad thing. Wallahi, it's a ni'mah from Allah that they want this. Let them look. I've told the government agencies in America, put a camera in my house, I don't care. Tap my phone, I don't care. I want you to see me. This is why I do what I do. I want you to see me. I want you to see what I have. I have a message from the creator of all things delivered to me by the greatest human being to ever walk the face of this earth and carried out through history through the greatest human beings that have ever walked this planet. I have a message for you. So look, listen, please. We have that opportunity now, brothers and sisters, that the world wants to know what you have. Give it to them. Give it to them. Allow them to see it in your life. Stop walking around with your head held down. Stop frowning. Stop being sad. You have Islam. You have something that will make you everything. I finish with this. Every time I have to go on a trip, and I'm gone for many days. My, my three children ask me why I have to go so much. My 10-year-old son asks me, Dad, why, do, why are you not here to put me to bed at night? Why are you not here to take me to school in the morning? My daughter, my smallest, who is the apple of her father's eye, cries. Cry, Wallah, he cries every time I kiss her goodbye and I'm leaving. It breaks my heart. And I tell them, that I'm doing this. I'm doing this in sincere hopes that I can live up to the standard of the people who followed Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that maybe, maybe through my efforts to try to emulate his life, I can get to drink that water from his hand at the house one day. That's all I want. That's all I care about. That's why I do it. You think this is easy traveling? Is it easy, Imam? No, it's not easy. This is rough. It's a rough life. Wallahi. If it were being paid by per hour, wouldn't be worth enough. You go beg in the streets for better. But we do it because we care. There's a concern right here. That I want to live up to the standard of the man whom I say I follow. I want to live up to that. And I tell my children every day, even if I don't come back, even if I don't make it back from this trip, if you grow up with Islam in your heart, to me you will have made me the proudest father. I don't care if you end up homeless. I don't care if you end up poor. I don't care if you end up eating out of trash cans. I don't care if you're sleeping on park benches. I don't care what else you become in this life. I don't care. If you die with that Islam deep in your heart and the last words out of your mouth are La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, I'll be happy. But if you leave this Islam, I've told my 10 year old, you understand, if you leave this Islam, I don't care if you become a rocket scientist. I don't care if you go to Mars. I don't care if you become the president. I don't care if you become a billionaire. I don't care what the world thinks you are. To me, you failed. You failed and you have nothing. Because with your Islam, you have everything, even if you have nothing else. Without Islam, you are and you have nothing. I don't care if the world is at your feet. جزاك الله خيرا بارك الله فيكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله